All right, hello and and uh, welcome everybody to our tonight's Zoom, uh, a virtual town hall meeting on the topic of our climate emergency. And uh, I think lately we've all come to, if we didn't come to the realization that we do have an emergency, uh, going through the summer with the storms and uh, the heat waves, and yesterday with the torrential rain, um, I mean, we know something is really happening uh, with our changing climate. And um, so we have a lot of climate energy goals in New York State that we're trying to meet. And so we need to prepare for them. So tonight we're gonna have a robust discussion on where we stand on addressing the issue in the state and what we must do going forward. And after our presentation by our three guests, um, Connor, uh, Bambrick and Kevin Lanahan and Eric Lewandowski. Uh, after we do their presentation, we're going to open up to a lot of lively questions. And if you've been on Zoom before, you know you can, there's a raise your hand place uh, if you want to do that. If not, you can put a question in the chat. Um, and we'll try to get to everybody's questions. So, um, Let's start with uh, Connor Bambrick, um, who on my screen is off in the corner. Um, the director, he is director of climate policy with environmental advocates of New York since 2013. And I must say uh, the environmental advocates are a wonderful um, organization uh, in New York state that I admire for all of the work that they do to help us as legislators uh, identifying um, good environmental legislation. Uh, he oversees the policy development and advocacy efforts on issues related to climate change, air quality, and energy policy. And prior to his time with environmental advocates, Connor was the legislative director to the chair of the state assembly energy committee. And I was never on the energy committee, but I remember Connor from there. So he joins us today to explain the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, which was passed in the legislature in 2019, and some upcoming legislation that will be important moving forward. So Connor, do you want to start our discussion? Absolutely. And thank you, Sandy, for having me on again. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to, to address your constituents here. Um, <clears throat> I'll start by sharing my screen here. Let's see if I can pull it off on my own. Okay, there we go. Um, <clears throat> so uh, my name is Connor Bamberg, Director of Climate Policy for Environmental Advocates NY. Uh, we are the organization based in Albany. Um, we work uh, on a wide range of issues, my areas, climate and energy, but we also work on things like clean water, um, land conservation, um, getting more funding generally for the environment. Um, uh, and we sort of serve as, as a watchdog uh, for what uh, both the legislature and the executive agencies are doing uh, to try and you know, make sure uh, that we're, we're on the right track. Um, Environmental Advocates is also a founding member of the NY Renews Coalition. This is a diverse coalition of over 200 groups now uh, that came together around the concepts of uh, coming up with a solution here for New York, uh, really grounded in, in um, uh, climate justice and equity. So uh, the coalition worked uh, for the past few years uh, on the Climate Community Protection Act, ultimately winding up uh, with passage of the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act uh, back in 2019. Uh, so Connor, I'm can, I, can I, Connor, can I interrupt you for one minute? Um, can you make your screen, I don't know, so that we can see all of the letters, at least on the left side, that's where I'm having the problem. That would be good. Um, Is there a way to make it smaller, maybe? I, I don't know. Somebody said enlarge, but. Oh, smaller. Do 
Yes, better. Yep. Thanks. Great. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I just it's probably this this slide that's that's the issue here. I apologize. Um, hopefully, the slides are better after this one. Um, so anyway, we uh, we worked uh, you know for a number of years back in 2019. Uh, the state legislature passed, and uh, you know, with the assembly's leadership, by the way, um, leadership community protection act. Uh, what this law does is uh, set some of the most aggressive uh, emissions reductions uh, mandates in the country. Um, it's going to require us to be uh, a forty percent reduction in greenhouse gases by twenty thirty, an eighty five percent reduction by twenty fifty. Uh, but it also sets other goals, uh, especially for our uh, electricity grid, as I'm sure you do, uh, have to talk about a little bit later. Uh, but we have renewables by the year 2030 uh, and 100% emissions free by the year 2040. Um, this is critical. This is not just uh, carbon emissions. We're talking about. Um, that's important because in order to meet the rest of our goals, we're going to have to electrify the rest of our economy, the transportation sector, the building sector, the manufacturing sector. Um, and then the other key piece of this is the uh, equity piece. Uh, there are mandates require uh, uh, at least 35% of uh, the funds that are going to be invested in clean energy uh, must go to disadvantaged communities, particularly low-income communities and communities of color. Um, there's also uh, what's known as the, the climate and equity screens uh, in this law. These are requirements that all state decision-making, all state must be measured against how it will impact achieving the goals of the climate law and how it's also going to impact disadvantaged communities. Saw that actually come into play just you know today uh, when DEC rejected uh, permanent applications for the Dance Gamer power plant uh, and the Astoria Energy power plant um, <clears throat> proposals. Uh, these are two projects that the DEC deemed uh, not in compliance with the climate law. Uh, so what this law did uh, is created a Climate Action Council. This is a 22 member council um charged with coming up uh with what is known as the scoping plan this is a plan that's going to identify all the different policy areas where the state needs to move either through regulation or legislation in order to achieve the goals of the climate law um, this council has been meeting uh since uh, back in march of 2020 um, their charge is to come up with a scoping plan uh, by the end of this year um, through, over the course of that time, a whole series of advisory panels was convened uh, in different sectors like transportation or energy or housing uh, to come up with a series of recommendations for the council to consider to help meet that goal. So those panels have also been working. And uh, an additional panel was also created under the law known as the Climate Justice Working Group. Now, this is a separate group of environmental justice leaders working with state agencies to come up with a definition of what will fit a disadvantaged community. And so the state can then figure out how to prioritize investments in those communities as the law requires. Uh, some things that we're looking for out of this process uh, as a coalition, we wanna make sure that this scoping plan meets the requirement that the minimum of a 35 to 40% of, of climate spending goes back directly into frontline communities. Um, we wanna make sure the equity screen and the climate screen I described earlier uh, are applied across the board and, and all agencies are, are working to implement them. So that there's a focus on not just greenhouse gas emissions, but uh, coal pollutants. These are the uh, pollutants that are likely causing the, the harmful health impacts in the communities where the polluters are located. Um, we wanna make sure that the state doesn't go forward with new fossil fuel uh, fire projects. This is infrastructure like new pipelines or the, the power plants that I was just discussing earlier. Um, and then uh, we don't wanna see any false solutions. There are a number of solutions that have been put out there uh, 
potentially continue investments in this existing infrastructure that's supporting natural gas at the moment. This includes uh, biofuels, renewable natural gas, or, or hydrogen. Um, we don't believe that basically, <laughs> we don't, anything that's gonna allow us to continue to burn, to burn stuff to power our economy, uh, we're viewing that as, as a false solution. <laughs> and then finally, we wanna make sure we're respecting indigenous uh, sovereignty uh, in this process, uh, making sure that uh, we are appropriately consulting uh, with the leadership of indigenous, indigenous communities. And other things we're looking for is making sure that there are strong labor standards. Provisions were passed in this past uh, state budget for clean energy projects, attaching strong labor provisions to it. We want to make sure that there's a just transition for communities uh, that burdened uh, by uh, the pollution, uh, making sure that they have the resources they need to transition to a fossil free economy or renewable energy economy, but also making sure that uh, the communities that have been hosting these uh, polluting facilities, making sure the workers there uh, you know, have the ability to transition, making okay. sure those communities that are receiving these are oftentimes large contributors of, of property tax payments to these communities, as I'm sure you all know here. Um, schools and local governments uh, receive the assistance they need. So where are we at right now? Um, as I mentioned earlier, the scoping plan is due by the end of the year. Uh, Council met just a few days ago, uh, and it was a, a very big meeting for that council um, at, at that time where uh, the state came back and presented to the council uh, the analysis of what it's going to take to meet this plan. And, you know, it, it just, it's a surprise to no one, it's going to be in the, the range of, of billions upon billions of dollars. Um, here are some of the key findings that they reported back, uh, is that the cost of inaction actually exceeds the cost of action by 80 to 150 billion dollars. Um, so this is really a win for New York and this doesn't even factor in uh, the amount of jobs uh, that are going to come into that. A new study on uh, jobs that are associated with achieving the goals of the mandate of, of the climate law uh, is expected at the next meeting in November um, and we're really looking forward to that one. But again, here scenarios that have played out uh, under each of the two pathways that they've identified going forward, uh, you see a significant savings here uh, through improvements in air quality, uh, energy efficiency, health benefits. You know, the, this New York really can't afford not to, to implement this law is was basically our takeaway here. In two months, what we can expect is um, initial scoping plan to sort of be presented uh, uh, at um, next Climate Action Council meeting in mid-November. Um, then they'll work a little bit more on it and we'll expect the final scoping plan to be, draft scoping plan to be uh, voted on by the Climate Action Council in early to mid-December. From there, the plan will then go out to the public. Uh, it'll be a year long process of public hearings throughout the state uh, where uh, you know, the opportunity to comment on the plan, to improve upon the plan uh, before that final plan is adopted at the end of next year. Um, so uh, what comes next? Um, the scoping plan is gonna have a suite of policies. Uh, some of them will be acted on regulatory through the agencies, but others are gonna require legislative action. Uh, the climate law really needs a dedicated funding line as well from the state. We know it's going to cost billions. We have to make sure we're making these investments up front. Um, the NY Renews Coalition is supporting uh, as a potential solution here, the Climate and Community Investment Act. This is a polluter pays model um, where we're, we're directly charging 
uh, those that are, you know, the fossil fuel industry essentially for, uh, for bringing these products into, into our state. Uh, and then the funds that will be raised from that will go back to household and small businesses in the form of rebates. Uh, they'll go to fund community just transition efforts. These will be community driven efforts that will for municipalities and, and community groups to come up with plans that'll fit their communities and, and, and they'll fund them the renewable energy. Other funds will go to infrastructure and then again to help fund displaced workers uh, and municipalities and school districts that might be impacted by a loss of tax revenue. And I'll, with that, I'll wrap it up here and happy to take questions later. Thank you. I think what we'll do, Connor, is wait for questions at the end. You're staying with us, right? Yep, of course. Yep, okay. Um, so, I mean, I just developed a few bunch of questions with your conversation, so, but we'll we'll get to that. Okay, thank you so much for your presentation and an update on, on where we are, um, you know, with a plan by the end of December, I guess. Plan of action. Um, now I'm going to ask uh, that Kevin Lenahan will be our next presenter, and he is the Vice President of Government and Corporate Communications with the New York State Independent System Operators. And I have to tell all of you, um, I didn't really know about the New York State Independent Operators originally, and we were invited, um, they came to my office, I guess, to talk to me about some issue many years ago, and um, I went over to visit their headquarters which I think is in Albany, right, Kevin? Uh, technically just across the river of Southern Oregon in East Greenbush. Okay, and I went there several times and it was amazing. It was just amazing. I wish you could all get up there. Um, you know, when you can travel in the future, maybe you might make an appointment to go and visit them because they're just great. Um, Kevin is an experienced energy professional with 13 years of experience with Con Edison. Uh, I don't think you want to be there now with all of our storms and the trees and everything falling apart, but we're good. Uh, he has knowledge of the New York's electric system, and he's joining us today to share about uh, the New York State Independence Operating uh, Plan for re Reliable Energy Grid of the Future. So welcome, Kevin. Yeah, thanks for the invitation and the kind introduction of some of them. And I'm happy to be with you and your constituents today. Uh, and thanks also to Connor for that presentation. Uh, Connor Bambrick and I have worked together for a number of different years, all the way back to, and you heard in his bio that um, he helped run the Energy Committee and the Assembly. That's when Connor and I got to know each other um, many years ago. And uh, it's nice to be with him again today. I'm, gonna, I'm also joined today by uh, Joanne Colosi from our office who runs a community affairs program. I'm gonna ask her to put the presentation up on the screen that we're gonna follow along with today. Since I'm technologically challenged, uh, we asked Joanne to help support us in the presentation. Uh, and I'll touch a little bit on the Climate Action Council. We got a good briefing from Connor about that. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the CLCPA too, um, but really what I'd like to focus on is the work that we have undertaken to reach those CLCPA goals. And as the Assemblywoman said, not everybody knows that we exist. Um, we're doing more to try and uh, reach out to communities, reach out to uh, public policy officials, opinion leaders, legislators, lawmakers, make sure that they know we exist and, and the efforts that we're undertaking to help the state get to the CLCPA goals. Uh, we look at the energy landscape and the policy landscape, that intersection of uh, between the um, economy, the technology, the climate issues, and the policy issues from a reliability point of view and have for the roughly 20 years that we've we've existed, but that's beginning to shift and change. And I'm gonna cover that as well today too. Um, like everything, we are, um, we are subject to change and we are initiating change in how, we're, how we run the organization and, and the responsibilities that we have. Uh, so we can move to the next slide, Jeff. Just cover who we are. So um, this is our mission. These are the four principles under which we operate. We are responsible, and you got a picture there to the right, and there's another one coming up with the control room that we operate out of. 
we, we see the entire transmission system. We do also have a look at, uh, through our technology, the distribution system. But really what we're responsible for is running the transmission grid from border to border, um, west to east and north to south, all the way to the tip of Long Island, that transmission system, the bulk electric system. And we know where each of the generators are. Um, the, uh, the traditional fossil fuel generators that are left in the state, um, the big wind farms in upstate, we know where the nuclear plants are and we can call on them and we tell them uh, when we need power and then we deliver that power along those transmission lines. Uh, we do so um, with an eye, like I mentioned, towards uh, reliability, making sure that that transmission backbone is as reliable as possible. We hand those electrons off, if you will, then to the local utility. So um, in your case, it's, uh, Con Edison and possibly parts of, of Westchester, um, New York State Electric and Gas or Avon Grid. Um, in upstate New York, of course, it's, uh, it's predominantly uh, national grid and, and that part of the system we do not have control over. That's the distribution system. Again, we can see what's happening there in large part, but we do not control that part of the system. Uh, but our role is really make sure that that reliability of the transmission backbone um, is, is maintained and not compromised even in the most extreme conditions. And then the second thing that we were charged with doing is overseeing the competitive electric markets where the commodity is bought and sold. Uh, we want to make sure that it's fair. We want to make sure that the pricing is transparent. Um, we have no financial stake in those transactions. Uh, we try and stay um, resource neutral. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about how some of that is changing later. But um, uh, we also have a big uh, department that looks on roughly a 10 year time horizon at the changes that are happening with the technology and the infrastructure and what then has to change on the transmission system to keep that transmission system reliable and running well. So a lot of, um, a lot of economists and engineers that are running a lot of studies with sophisticated software, trying to understand, especially now these days, uh, uh, with the influx of renewables, what other investments have to be made on the transmission system to, uh, to bring more renewables on, uh, onto the grid, but do so in a safe and reliable way. And then lastly, what we're doing here today, that's the other part of our mission. Uh, we are impartial, we'll talk a little bit about, uh, more about this in a minute, but we, uh, we do not lobby, we try not to um, uh, advocate in the halls of the legislature for one piece of legislation or another. We like to traffic in facts. Like I said, we've got a lot of people who run a lot of studies um, and come up with a lot of data and information. We like to summarize that, bring that to policymakers, lawmakers, opinion leaders like Connor and his group, to make sure that they understand what we're seeing on the system so that the best investments can be made uh, and that everybody has the uh, same access to the same amount of information uh, that, that, uh, that we're seeing. So as you see at the bottom there, we are a 5013C not-for-profit. We do take a small, uh, very small, uh, about a penny on, on the dollar uh, charge when there's a transaction made through the markets to run our budget. Our budget is completely transparent and public. Uh, it's held to scrutiny by the Public Service Commission. If we uh, need to borrow, which is unlikely, we cannot do so without the Public Service Commission giving us that authority. Um, and we are heavily um, regulated, which we're gonna to get to in a minute. Uh, so when we talk about regional transmission organizations or independent system operators, we're a little unique in that we have the only uh, single state ISO. There are ISOs that cover roughly 70% of the transmission system uh, across the country, but none uh, like New York cover border to border in the entire state. There's um, a regional transmission organization that covers part, much of the part, uh, much of the state of Texas and much of the state um, of California, but not all of those states are covered by reg uh, their regional transmission organization. And there are others that are made up of multi-states. 
we're the we're unique in that our we are the only like i said single single state border to border iso or rto uh we were set up under federal um uh law in 1998 along with these other organizations and it was a it was a joint effort between the state at the time and the federal uh, government at the time uh, decided that this was a more efficient system was a more efficient way and lower cost way of addressing our, our energy needs and without getting you know, too far into the weeds um uh, it was decided back then that we that uh, generation had to be separated from uh, transmission and distribution in order to create more efficiencies and lower costs, and uh, and that's our charge. We operate the system um, at the lowest cost possible and uh, in the most reliable way possible. Uh, I'll just make one other note here that under this Federal Energy Regulatory Commission which is the regulatory agency that oversees everything that we do uh, down in Washington, D.C., with recent appointments by the Biden administration, uh, they are initiating a proceeding to, to, um, to gather more parts of the state that are not covered by RTOs or ISOs into that structure. They, they, uh, they, they think, among other things, it's a more efficient, lower cost way to do things and that that's been proven over uh, the course of the last two decades, but also now that we look at um, the need to perhaps, and this is what the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission is, is uh, focused on these days, uh, build transmission from where the um, it's best to harvest renewables in the nation and deliver that over large transmission lines it would be more efficient if we had RTOs and ISOs covering those places on that map that you see currently aren't served by our organizations. Uh, next slide, John. Uh, just a few statistics, and I, I really just want to draw your attention uh, about, a, I really want to draw your attention to the picture of that control room. And, and again, as, as the assemblywoman offered, uh, we, we do when, and we should be opening this back up again in uh, 2022, but we do offer tours of the control room you can see and get a very good education into what goes into running the transmission system. Uh, our operators are working around the clock in 12 hour shifts, constantly monitoring the flow of electricity uh, from, like I said, to the farthest reaches of uh, the western part of the state and uh, the north country all the way down to Long Island. Uh, it's a purpose driven organization. We have roughly 570 employees that wake up every day knowing that they are serving all of the state and that um, the ability to stay reliable down to that distribution system relies on them. Uh, and they do think about that distribution system. You know, if you walk outside uh, your house and you see the, the wires up and down the street, that's not us, but we know that we. Um, we have to operate the transmission system so that distribution system that serves you, your home, your business, uh, your school, your uh, hospital depends on the work that we do uh, out in East Greenwood. So we take the independence of the organization very seriously. Uh, myself and the rest of the employees, every year we have to sign an attestation that we hold no financial interest in that, that is um, all the way down to stockholders and any market participant that participates uh, in the ISO process. And um, we have a shared governance process that helps us make decisions about the changes that are gonna impact the way that we do run the system and the way that we do oversee those competitive markets. We cannot do anything unilaterally. We can't wake up our staff uh, can I wake up one day and decide that we're going to change the rules under which we operate? We have to, um, we have that governance process that's like a legislative process that decides uh, and, and updates the rules under which we, um, we take care of reliability and, and, under, uh, and the rules under which those competitive markets are, are operating. And there's a lot of changes that are being debated these days. Connor's very familiar with this about how to operate those markets as we see new products and services and we see new technologies start to enter the system. Um, 
Let me talk about the governance process just a little bit, fill you in on how that works. We, we do have the traditional industry companies that, that participate in our governance process. For instance, Con Edison, uh, for instance, the owners of the traditional uh, fossil fuel, natural gas run uh, facilities. But we, we also have an increasing number of uh, wind developers, battery storage companies, um, solar developers, environmental advocates like Connor and his organization are um, increasingly getting uh, signing up as a uh, market participant and joining our process. We have environmental justice advocates. Connor talked about the Climate Action Council and, um, and, and those proceedings and the uh, Climate Justice Working Group. Well, we, we have members of that Climate Justice Working Group that participate in our governance process. They debate, they argue um, their side of, of these issues and how we might change the rules under which you know, we operate the markets or, or uh, uh, position ourselves on reliability rules. So it's, uh, it's democratic to say the least, it is robust, it is uh, interesting uh, to sit and listen, especially these days to um, uh, the different positions that people take on, on how to build the grid of the future. I mentioned that we are heavily regulated. So it's a misnomer when we talk about deregulation at the turn of the last century. Uh, and, and we have a number of oversight agencies that watch everything that we do. Uh, a lot of these are keyed towards maintaining reliability of the system. So the New York State Reliability Council, which is, as it suggests, uh, New York focused, uh, the Northeast Power Coordinating, Coordinating Council, which um, uh, takes into account all of, all of New England, um, our state, all the way up into Canada, they're looking at regional reliability. Um, that organization uh, took what happened in 2003 with the Northeast blackout very seriously and said, okay, we've, we've got to look at reliability, um, investment in the system, not just the, in a state by state um, uh, 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 position, but also an entire uh, regional position all the way up in Canada since the, the transmission system is interconnected. Uh, I mentioned the regulation that the Public Service Commission uh, has with, uh, with regard to our borrowing process and our spending process. They also participate with us in setting something called the reserve margin. And that's just determining how much uh, electricity over and above our historic peak demand we're going to need in order to um, maintain reliability and account for those really tough days when everybody's got their air conditioning on, air conditioners on, and uh, we're, we're straining the system. Uh, and then uh, we have the North American Reliability Corporation, and they are based out of uh, BC, and they look at all of the ISOs and all of the RTOs to make sure that they are all um, operating under uh, minimum standards for the industry. And then I've mentioned the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission a number of times. Any change that we need to, that we, uh, along with the market participants and the stakeholders make to our rules has to um, go down to the, to the FERC where they pour over it, their staff looks at it, they open a public proceeding for comments down there uh, and, uh, and nothing gets changed without their approval. So that's, that's the uh, regulatory process as far as we're concerned. And I will just uh, end this slide by noting that we operate the New York ISO um, with these many layered uh, regulatory agencies and oversight agencies pursuant to the strictest reliability standards in the nation. So let's talk about the state of the grid. What are we dealing with these days? What does it look like? And what, where do we have to go in order to reach those environmental goals? Uh, certainly, we've got more renewables that are connecting to our system. We are busy at the New York ISO. We have to uh, run a uh, report and study whenever any uh, major generating unit wants to connect to the system. We look at the impact that, that that facility will have on the system. Sometimes upgrades are necessary and, and we tell um, these, these developers before they connect to the system that they're going to have to participate in um, upgrading the, uh, the transmission system before they can connect. 
we are looking at distributed energy resources more and more as an organization. Those are the small um, generating facilities that you might install for perhaps um, at your business or uh, at your home. We need to know where those small scale solar um, generating units are in order to back down uh, generation by the traditional larger fossil fuel plants. It doesn't make any sense if we're calling on those plants to generate a thousand megawatts on a constant basis when more and more solar is being installed on rooftops in Westchester County. So we have technology and we work very closely uh, with the state and, um, and weather technology to understand where those resources are. We are changing our rules to integrate specifically new storage technologies uh, more and more. We just um, connected our first co-located storage and wind facility, which is out um, uh, somewhere around Utica. And uh, that's an exciting development. Um, and then we're focused on maintaining the reliability of the system during the, throughout this transition as the new technologies come onto the grid. Because this future grid is going to require more flexibility. Um, and we are going to uh, we're going to have to build more transmission from upstate New York, where we have a lot of renewables, down to the load centers like Westchester County, where and New York City and Long Island, where the population centers are, and the greatest demand there. Next slide, Joe. So this is what I'm talking about when I when I mention that transmission system and uh, the challenges with delivering the renewables. Uh, if you look at that donut chart on the left, that's by and large what our upstate energy profile looks like. So the, the light shaded blue, when I talk about upstate, that's what I'm referring to. And that's where most of the nuclear is. That's where most of the wind and the, um, and the hydro resources are located. So on balance, that's carbon neutral. Um, and uh, if you look at the donut chart to the right, you see that we still have a ways to go getting rid of the, uh, the fossil fuel generation that the CLCPA uh, seeks to, to, uh, to switch to renewables. So we, in the meantime, as we pursue those goals, we need to build more transmission lines uh, and think of those as highways. To, to get the uh, carbon-free electrons from upstate to those uh, population centers where the demand is greatest. And we are making progress at uh, developing the transmission along with the Public Service Commission, uh, which I won't get too far into, but we, we are seeing some real progress there. There's uh, additional lines. That fuzzy yellow uh, line that you see in the center of the map there, that's uh, that is the area of the transmission system that gets very constrained during the summer and the hottest days. And, uh, and, and so if we're able to build additional lines, uh, which again, we're making some progress on, but we're gonna to need to make more, we can relieve that constraint, we can deliver more carbon-free uh, power to, uh, to downstate. And then back down that, uh, that donut chart you see on the right. Thanks, Joe. So uh, I just want to just note that over our 20 year history, the markets have helped participate. We kind of mentioned those co-pollutants and uh, aside from uh, carbon dioxide, the, the markets have really driven down, uh, helped to drive down the SOX and NOx emissions rates for the state of New York. And, and that's by um, competition. So. If a if, uh, new technology comes on the system, new cleaner, uh, cutting edge uh, fossil uh, uh, natural gas technology has come on the system over the last 20 years. It's, uh, it's cheaper to run, it's more efficient to run, and it's pushed out those older, um, dirtier, less efficient uh, polluting uh, generating stations. Now that's, we're in a different time frame now and we are pursuing PLCPA goals and we have a statute in place and we, can, and we consider the New York ISO those, those uh, goals under the CLCPA our goals. So we've got a ways to go, but we believe that the markets have proven over the last 20 years, driving down the NOx and SOx rates, that, that the markets can also help incentivize tech, new technology to drive down those CO2 rates. So that's the point of this slide. And you know, we've got 20 years of, uh, of effort and data and success to draw from. So, um, 
There, there are uh, efforts by the state the signing contracts, uh, renewable energy contracts with uh, clean developers. We believe that our markets can work alongside and in harmony with the, that, those efforts to, uh, to attack the CO2 rates. And now we'll move into some more details and wrap this up on the CFCPA efforts and how uh, we intersect with those things. Uh, so when we look at the 2030 and the 2040 goals, um, and you see the, um, the markers here, and, and these are some of the, you know, these are the goals articulated just like, like Connor did. Um, and I mentioned the, the wholesale markets being able to drive down emissions rates over the last 20 years, and we think we can, we can help uh, drive down those CO2 emission rates. We believe the, the competitive markets can get some of those, um, you know, we're, we're, we believe we can get to the 2030 goals with wind at the pace we get, we're developing it now, with solar at the pace we're developing it now, and with those battery storage goals. It's going from the 2030 to the 2040 goals, frankly, folks, it's gonna be the real challenge. Uh, we're going to need that 9,000 megawatts of offshore wind for sure, but we're going to also need newer technologies. And, and, uh, and Connor did point out, you know, his role is to keep the, the public policy honest, if you will, and make sure that, you know, in accordance with the, the statute, that there is no fossil fuel technology. Uh, we think that there is some carbon capture technology that's in R&D and some other, um, other technologies that can come off the sidelines if the competitive markets um, are able to incentivize those with uh, innovation and the right pricing. So that's the, that's the real power of the competitive markets that we think can help participate in getting to the CLCPA goals, moving from that 2030 challenge to the 2040 challenge and closing that gap. Uh, so I just uh, thought this was an interesting slide for folks to take a look at. I mentioned that process of analyze uh, that we are responsible from that planning and reliability point of view to look at and study and, and report on each generating unit that wants to connect to the system. So uh, think, of, think of it as a, um, a new graduating class because that's what we call it. We call it the class year. And uh, uh, people, you know, developers can line up, if you will, and come uh, and, and um, uh, put their proposal into our class year for evaluation. And that chart, that bar chart you see on the left is a, is a picture of the current class year. So we have a roughly two, almost 3000 megawatts of wind being analyzed by the New York ISO right now for interconnection to the system. We have roughly 1600 uh, megawatts of solar. Um, there is still some natural gas that uh, is proposing to connect to the system, believe it or not. And, uh, and about a thousand megawatts of new transmission. And the storage bar is uh, interesting to see because that was almost nothing just a couple of years ago. So that is, uh, is increasing as well. As I said, our role is not to pick and choose winners and losers. That is, you know, that is uh, or which resource or which, which technology um, gets to be analyzed. Our role is to look at each and every one. The permitting process does not happen in, uh, at, at the New York ISO. We are not a state agency. So Connor mentioned uh, the decision by the DEC today to um, say that two proposals uh, by um, natural gas developers were not in compliance with the CLCK. That is not our role. Our role is strictly to look at these projects from a reliability point of view see where it's best that they connect to the system and that they do so reliably. Uh, so we still do see some natural gas that's lining up seeking to connect to the system. Uh, and I think this is our last slide. And I just wanted to point out that the New York ISO um, has changed in uh, with respect to our mission that we began with. So we, uh, as I mentioned, we have those four pillars of our mission. We look at uh, the markets and, and running the system from uh, that lowest cost and reliability perspective. Well, we're shifting and we're changing. And we are actually about to announce a change in our vision and our mission in a couple of weeks here. 
which articulates a third element, which will be a pursuit of CLCPA goals and the cleanest uh, and the cleanest system in the country. So, uh, so it's a significant change for our organization. And uh, as I said, we take the New York CLCPA state goals as our own. And uh, we ran a climate change impact and resilience study last year. Um, and one of the takeaways from that study, and it, and it showed that we got a lot of work to do and we need to do it fast in order to uh, decarbonize the system. But it did show, as I mentioned, from that 2030 marker to the 2040 marker is going to be the real leap and the real challenge. And we still are going to have to develop those new technologies that we don't have a solution for yet. We don't have an answer for yet. And that's that gray shaded spot there. So you look at the donut chart and it's clear you know, where the offshore wind is going to participate and get into the goal. It's clear um, you know, how much, uh, for instance, land-based wind we can expect to develop and it's clear what uh what kind of storage resources we we can expect to have but we're going to fall short if we don't get those new technologies or we don't overdevelop uh, some of these other uh, attributes and resources to get to that 2040 goal so um, significant challenge i think we're well on our way to, to meeting the 2030 goals if we continue the pace we have uh, but this is really a moonshot, and it's going to take uh, markets along with the, the state efforts to get there. And I think that's going to wrap us up for today. Although, um, yeah, we can move to the next slide, Joe. I just wanted to make sure, and I'm pretty sure Mike Hughes is there, uh, some of the women. But uh, cybersecurity is a big deal these days. We, um, we think about that 24 7. We are always guarding our system to make sure that it's safe. Uh, we um, go above and beyond the state and the federal um, critical infrastructure protection standards. And I always try and wrap up with this slide to make sure that people understand that even if it's not top of mind for you, that's something that's top of mind for us. Uh, maintaining reliability is not just moving those electrons uh, across the transmission system down to your, your home, your business, your hospital, your school. It's also protecting the infrastructure and the software uh, and the tools that we use to run that system. And I will stop there. Kevin, thank you so much. Sandy, you muted. Sandy, you're muted. Thanks so much, Kevin, for your wonderful discussion uh, about the independent system operators. And I think we've we've come a long way from where we were, and away, away, but we have such a long way to go. And um, you know, I, I think your presentation was great. Uh, now we're going to turn to Eric Lewandowski. And I want everybody to keep their questions. Um, Andrew Liebert, in my office, is keeping a running tally of. Uh, people that want to ask questions. Um, and I, I just want to thank Claire Wexted in my office um, who has put this uh, form together and she's actually answering phone calls when people call the office and say they want to get on. So anyway, Eric, um, you uh, are the Youth Action Coordinator with Croton 100, an organization that aims to bring Croton on Hudson into the future by helping residents reduce their carbon footprints and transition to a more sustainable means of living. And I remember, um, you know, the reason we asked you to come, a lot of my communities now do have, um, you know, uh, like Austin 100 or whatever, uh, a group, but you were really, Croton was the one that, that I thought was one of the, the earlier um, uh, groups that got together and, um, you know, what, what you've been able to do, I think has impacted other people too. So Eric, um, as, as he is an associate professor in the Department of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at NYU, uh, contributing author of a new report that details the findings of the largest international survey of climate anxiety in children and young people, which shows how climate anxiety is linked to government inaction. Um, and I just like to say that we've been getting a number of emails from uh, youth in the community, some through their participation in government programs in high school. And the questions we've been asked are basically about climate issues. 
So um, that's what young people are at the moment, I can see are very, very concerned about. So we welcome you here today. Great, thank you uh, for having me. I'm very glad to be here. And let me see if I can figure out how to share my screen. Can you all see that? Is that working? Yes. Okay. It's working. Okay. Um, and so actually, uh, I've, it's a privilege to listen to the other speakers who uh, spend their time legislating and building the future. I, as a clinical psychologist, I spend my time thinking about other aspects of the climate crisis. And so that's what I'm going to be talking about today. And I'm going to try to tie um, uh, the mental health aspects, the emotional aspects down to our, um, the presence of Croton 100 here in Croton and really trying to translate that big picture down to um, things that we can do in our community to support youth or to engage youth to their benefit uh, emotionally. Um, so hang on. Oh, I'm sorry, if you just bear with me one second, I disconnected my keyboard. Okay, here we go. All righty. So I'll just uh, quickly run through some facts that this audience is probably well acquainted with. So we are currently, um, we're, we're living on a warming planet, of course. Um, CO2 is the highest it's ever, it's been in the last 2 million years. And we've just lived through the hottest decade in the last 125,000 years. Um, this is characterized by, sorry, I'm gonna move this because I'm blocking. Uh, characterized by warming oceans, melting poles, rising sea levels, ocean acidification, extreme heat, disruptions in the water cycle, drought, wildfires, hurricanes and floods as we've seen this summer threats to the water supply, food production, and attendant migration and, uh, and conflict. And the graphs here on the side, actually I should say that the 2021 IPCC report that was um, released just in August, this uh, just the other month, was described by Antonio Guterres, the uh, Secretary General of the United Nations as code red for humanity. And so as we've all been talking about, this requires the drastic uh, decrease of global carbon emissions by 50% by 2030 and 100% by 2040 to prevent the most dire impacts of climate change. And these graphs here on the side just show the uh, climb in uh, carbon concentration in the atmosphere from basically the end of the industrial revolution till present and the corresponding rise of temperature from pre-industrial times till over that same period of about 1.1 degrees Celsius currently. And this is uh, per the IPCC unequivocally due to human Eric, you're muted. I have been muted this whole time? No, no not the whole time. Mm -hmm. Oh, it just muted itself. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's bizarre. Okay. Um, so I'll just put up some of those climate events here. Um, so storms, melting permafrost, chronic drought, acute drought, floods, extreme heat, wildfires, changing landscape, rising sea level, air pollution. And if we think about the impact of these things on our lives, on livelihoods, on our loved ones, on our landscapes, on uh, our homes, on the, the bonds of our social and community bonds and basic human necessities of food and water and medical care, it's no surprise that there are mental health impacts directly as a result of these events. So there's a well-established relationship in the scientific literature between natural disasters and post-traumatic stress. Um, there is um, a well-established relationship between heat and aggression, violent crime, homicide, suicide. There is a relationship in the literature between drought and depression, for example, among farmers and uh, also uh, between air pollution and behavior problems in children and cognitive problems in the elderly. So these are the direct, th these mental health impacts are directly related to the climate events that we're now experiencing. And these will increase, these problems will increase as the, as the frequency and severity of the events increase. But what the global study that uh, Sandy referred to, um, uh, um, apologies Sandy for the first name basis, Assemblywoman Galef, um, are, um, is an indirect experience. So we don't actually have to be, as we're well acquainted with by now, um, currently experiencing a climate event or an extreme weather event to feel distress about the climate crisis. And the American Psychological Association has used the term eco-anxiety to describe a chronic fear of environmental doom. And there are a lot of words that are used interchangeably, uh, you know, eco-stress. My, my particular favorite is climate anxiety. Um, and really there's no established definition 
uh, or prevalence data for this condition. It, it's, this, is, this is in the process of being established, but it's characterized by bouts of worry, grief, despair, panic, sadness, hopelessness, and anger about the climate future or about the deteriorating um, environment. Uh, this is a common question, a good question is, is climate anxiety a mental illness? And I can say emphatically, no, that climate change is a real threat and it's, it's reasonable to be worried. Um, so in this case, anxiety is an adaptive emotion signaling danger. I, I should mention that in severe cases, there can be clinical, the reaction can be clinically significant. And a good comparison is grief, for example, universal human experience, one of the most painful things that people endure. Nobody would ever say that that is a, a psychiatric problem, but doesn't mean that it can't be uh, enormously painful and debilitating. So I'll just move on now to talk about, I'm gonna move you guys over here again. Um, a global study, uh, th this, the global study that uh, Sandy referred to, and this is the, the uh, largest study, in fact, the only study, global study of climate anxiety, or I should say it's the largest ever uh, at any age um, globally. And we looked at 10,000 young people, children and young people between the ages of 16 and 25 from 10 countries, the countries you see listed here. And what I'd like to do is share some of those results with you. So this is the global, this is the entire sample of 10,000 respondents. This is so eight out of 10 young people in our sample across the world, including the United States, worry that climate change is threatening people and planet. And 45% report a negative impact on daily functioning, which includes eating, sleeping, concentrating on work or school, having fun and, and the quality uh, of their relationships, their ability to participate in, in rewarding relationships. And you can see here along the bottom, we have, uh, this is the global, this is the full sample. Um, over 50, uh, almost 60% are saying they're very worried or extremely worried. And 85% uh, are moderately worried or more. And a very small minority, a very tiny proportion of the sample is not worried at all. If we look at this in the US, the impacts uh, so far are relatively less. So we have more or less uh, approaching 50% who are very worried or extremely worried, and now up to 75% who are uh, moderately worried. I should note that these data were collected between March and June of 2021, before the summer that we had. And I would suspect that if we repeated this study, it had done it in, in August, September, and October, we might see this might be more pronounced. So um, we asked uh, our respondents about their feelings uh, to the extent to which they were feeling a range of different feelings. And I wanna highlight here that large majorities, 58, 57%, almost 60% of respondents said, and this is now in the US specifically, not the global sense. So we're now talking about the, thousand, the 1,000 respondents in the US reported that they are anxious, sad, and afraid. And a very small minority, one in four more or less, uh, reported only only that amount reported that they are indifferent or optimistic about climate change. Eight out of ten in the U.S. think that people have failed to take care of the planet. Almost seven in ten think that the future is frightening. Almost half think that they won't have access to the same opportunities that their parents had. Over one third think that their family's security will be threatened, whether it's economic, social, or, or physically. And almost four in 10, 36% are hesitant to have children because of climate change. And I should note that this doesn't mean that they have made a decision not to have children, but just that the distress about climate change is impacting your thinking about these uh, foundational decisions, life decisions. So this is just that, this is those statistics represented graphically. Another question we asked, uh, our respondents told us that nearly half of them, nearly half the children and young people we surveyed have felt dismissed or ignored by people when they try to talk about climate change. And this is again, the global sample. When it comes to perceptions of government response, how is the climate crisis being managed and how do they feel governments are doing? Large majorities, again, did not have uh, in endorsed really negative thoughts about that. So 60% or more than 60% said that governments are failing young people or are lying about the impact of their actions. Um, almost 60%, well over 50% felt that governments were dismissing people's distress and betraying them and their and future generations. 
when it comes to the positive aspects of government, uh, much fewer said that they believed that governments were acting according to the science, protecting them and future generations, doing enough to prevent the climate crisis, taking their concerns seriously, or that they could be trusted. Young people, uh, when asked about their feelings about the government response, well, those are, say, thoughts to the previous slide. They described feeling anguished, abandoned, afraid, angry, ashamed, and belittled. So I just want to play a clip for you. So, so these results have made quite an impact in the media, and you, you may have come across them. Um, they've ended up uh, in, in, at the highest platform uh, politically. And I just want to play a brief clip. This is Secretary General uh, uh, Antonio Guterres from the United Nations addressing the General Assembly in New York uh, on September 21st. This is a short clip, about 45 seconds. Okay, so of course we were startled that uh, that um, uh, the Secretary General referred to the study, but it's so, uh, I find it so powerful to hear him speak those words at that platform. So let's move now to talk about um, the response. So what does this, what do the findings of this study uh, dictate? What do they indicate? And in a word, it's a lot of nuance here, but they unambiguously, they indicate action. And our particular study really is talking about the action of government. Um, you know, I know that here in, in Westchester County in Croton on Hudson, we have climate advocates, we have climate champions as our elected officials, and that's a really great thing. And we're going, we, we support them and we'll continue to support. Um, but when it comes to, you know, so that's really our, our, our reach as, uh, as voters, let's say. But when it comes to individuals and communities, this is really the, now the territory of Croton 100 and other organizations locally. What, what response, you know, what does that response look like here? And I would say, first and foremost, when it comes to supporting young people, meeting young people in this crisis, it is first and foremost to listen, to allow these conversations to occur at the dinner table in your family, wherever they may be, to validate uh, the, young, the distressed young people are feeling, and then to partner in pursuit of solutions. So it's not just to listen and to validate and then you know, business as usual, but to actually have that conversation be the origin or, or, or uh, a contributing factor to continued efforts um, within our community, within, within the families in our community to uh, have impact in the climate crisis and within our reach here. And what this, this is a bit of a paradox I find, you know, we talk about the leadership that young people are demonstrating and how inspiring that can be. And I hear a lot from young people that, that it's a burden to feel that the older generation is relying on the energy and, and for inspiration in the younger generation. And so really what this calls for is the older generation to heed the call and for each, for all of us in our own ways, to the extent that we're possible to become leaders of our own. And I also, um, I'm sure many of you ha have the question I'm asked often, I, I have this question myself, where does hope come from? And really hope comes from action, this action. We can be the creators of hope. So now we're gonna talk about action. And, and this is something that I'm sure you've all felt. I certainly have felt it. And this is a real barrier to action, I would say. The feeling that we are all just one person, that our, our individual actions as a single person are insignificant. And I find this picture really, really powerful because here's one person who wasn't alone for very long. And what this picture illustrates for me is that sitting in our chairs in our homes right now that we can't, we, well, actually our presence here would, is part of this, I would say, we, we can't appreciate the aggregate. We can't see, we can't connect, we can't feel the size of the movement 
all of the people, the enormous numbers of people who have these concerns and who want to take action, who are taking action. And so, you know, there is a direct impact of that in terms of sustainability practices. Um, there is a political pressure that can be exerted by a group like this uh, all around the world, wherever they are. Um, and also we have a very powerful impact, a powerful ability to shape the norms of our communities. And so um, Senator Ed Markey, who's one of the authors of the Green New Deal, a Senator from Massachusetts, was asked in an interview, what can ordinary people do to help with, with the, you know, the climate legislation, that, that particular piece of legislation was the point of the question. And he said, we need an army. And I interpret that to mean this, what I've just been saying. And so in the words of um, Harriet Sugarman, who's the uh, founding, um, uh, lead, uh, founding uh, founder of the uh, climate reality chapter in New York City, she says, look no further, the army is you. So that's what I'm gonna talk about now. So what does it mean to be a part of this army? In my view, it means to accept and welcome the climate crisis, uh, the challenge of the climate crisis and to bring it to the center of our identity and then to look for every expression we can find of that identity to tackle the climate crisis. So this, an individual, this, this will have several domains perhaps and we might look to all of these to figure out what can we do in each of them. So at an individual and family level, this is where Cro the focus of Croton 100 is primarily. Well, I would say start to talk about it in your family. Talk about it within households. To become educated about fossil fuels and create a family climate plan to reduce your carbon footprint within your household. And uh, Croton 100 and, and sort of the umbrella organization Cure 100 has a really good carbon tracker that you can use as a resource for that and all kinds of information related to that. And then to really consider carbon exposure in all of your decisions, choices, activities, and routines. At school and at work, again, talk about it. Make this something that is talked about openly. It's really not, it doesn't make you, historically, it doesn't make you very popular, um, but it's really something we need to start to talk about. To use your platform, whatever it is, to ask what can you do with your interests, skills, and within your sphere of influence. Join or start a club or interest group. Lobby your administration at your school or your workplace to prioritize sustainability. In your community, talk about it again. Become a node. If you see me at Sunset Park Playground in Croton on Hudson, it won't be long before I start to tell you about something about climate change, what we're trying to do, or a question that I have. I want to talk about this all the time. How do I, uh, how, how do I get off of my oil boiler in my basement, and who can help me think through that? Join an organization. Croton 100 is a good one. There are others locally. Mothers Out Front has a presence in Croton. Throughout Westchester County, there are organizations all over the place. Support local sustainable businesses and let these businesses and others know of your commitment to sustainability. Participate in local politics as you're all doing here tonight and ensure your officials know your views. And then again, at a national level, join the movement. So find an organization, a national or international organization that you can support, whether it's, for example, these are just some examples. There are, there are many, many, but Greenpeace, 350.org, the League of Conservation Voters, the Sunrise Movement, these are all places just as a, a, for starters. There's an option, there are global trainings, local and global trainings to become a climate reality leader. That's Al Gore's organization. Uh, and to support uh, candidates, political candidates who are climate champions. And then of course, it goes without saying vote. So just a word about uh, our efforts um, at Croton 100 to uh, the youth engagement effort, the emerging youth engagement effort. And really what this is, is, is an interest of providing an opportunity uh, for youth to engage in local climate solutions. And it's really in the spirit of Croton 100's mandate, which is, which, which is to educate about carbon, to engage, um, to engage our community um, in thinking about reducing carbon and then through that engagement to in fact reduce carbon. Um, and some of our uh, initial ideas are to facilitate outreach to businesses for the purpose of um, education and promotion of sustainable practices within businesses, and to really start to have, to have the youth uh, engage with sort of um, um, visible parts of our community so that though, and, and to communicate to them how important this is so that our community can start to reflect the concern and reflect the priorities as seen by the young people. And this, is, this will be a concern to all of us, but this is 
this is the approach that we're taking with young people. Um, so this, and by the way, I should say that the ideas, the particular direction that we take with this is going to be really guided by the students. These are students in the local high schools and middle school, and, and if, we can, if we can, the elementary school. And so this is an idea that came from our most recent meeting to develop a training hub for peer-to-peer -peer education among students to really facilitate the spread among the classrooms, among the students. And this is not really going to be school-based, but uh, among people who are classmates. Um, and, and we're going to continue to try to snowball that involvement among young people. And they're going to be able to earn community service hours for their participation. And really broadly, what this what we're hoping this, this is in the direction of is promoting sustainability norms right here in Croton. And I just thought I would end with this uh, quote because it's, it sort of gets at this um, tension between you know, the, the enormous scale of the action that, that is needed and then the perception that we are such small, small parts of it. So I'll just read it out loud. It's not given to us to know which acts or by whom will cause the critical mass to tip towards an enduring good. What is needed for dramatic change is an accumulation of acts, adding, adding, adding to, adding more, continuing. We know that it does not take everyone on earth to bring justice, I'm covering it again, and peace, but only a small determined group who will not give up during the first, second, or hundredth gale. One of the most calming and powerful actions you can do to intervene in a stormy world is to stand up and show your soul. Soul on deck shines like gold in dark times. And this is by uh, Clarissa uh, Pinkola Estes, who's an American writer, activist, and psychologist. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Eric. That was terrific. And a different perspective than I have um, thought about. I thought your report was wonderful. And just so uh, we're gonna start with, the, I'm gonna do the first question um, that Andrew will do the set. He'll tell us me who the second one is, but um, we had we had gotten a question from Megan Dyer of Mothers Out Front earlier in the day, and I just want to say that in Croton they had um, a wonderful um, event with students and a rally talking about legislation, and it was terrific. It was the second one I've been to, I think, with the Croton students. And it was wonderful. And Megan was a part of, of organizing that. And there was a speaker also from Croton 100 there too. So I just, and that was a wonderful example of students being involved. So, but Megan asked of Connor, um, how can we get our gas and electric providers to help make this transition to a 100% renewable energy at this moment Con Ed is planning to put $1.2 billion worth of gas infrastructure into Westchester. And I, and I actually think that Kevin kind of mentioned that we're still getting this. Um, and more into New York City as well. And ratepayers like my family will have to pay for it with soaring gas bills, but we can only use it for 10 years according to CLCPA law. I mean, how, how do we deal with that? Connor, uh, it was directed to you. Sure. Well, um, <laughs> yes, it's definitely an issue that's still out there. We're still seeing, as Kevin mentioned earlier, we're still seeing proposals for, for new natural gas infrastructure. Um, and it's, it's something that, uh, you know, we, we really have to work hard to push back on uh, and to encourage other alternative non-pipes, non-wire solutions uh, to, to deal with gas when it comes to, to heating, at least. Um, and to you know, encourage uh, the state's public service commission, uh, either through direct contact or contact through your local assembly uh, members and, and senators um, to uh, you know, encourage them to really make a priority of allowing uh, the state's utilities to make the types of investments needed to help us transition, you know, uh, encouraging, uh, incentivizing e-pump programs, for example, and allowing them to to, uh, you know, to, to make that a part of their business model. That's a direction that the state is going in, probably needs to be moving quicker. Um, another area, encouraging uh, more robust investment in the transmission and distribution sector, also a path that the state is going down, but making sure that the electric grid uh, 
properly modernized uh, to be able to handle a, a renewable energy system. Um, so again, I'd say uh, make sure uh, you're getting involved uh, with groups that are advocating before the Public Service Commission. Um, I'd encourage you to, to check out NY Renews, for example. Um, but I know uh, uh, local Hudson Valley, the uh, Pace Energy and Climate Center is very good on these issues. Um, and I'll stop there, see if anybody else wants to add anything. Okay, anybody else want to? I mean, when somebody asks a certain question of either Connor or Kevin or Eric, anybody else can answer to if you want to. But if not, we'll go on to the next question. Well, um, Sandy, uh, Megan actually had a quick follow-up to add on to that. So Megan wants to unmute herself. Okay. Hi, hi, thanks everybody. Especially thanks to um, Assemblywoman Gala for pulling this together. I think it's so incredibly important for our children that they see our elected officials um, really paying attention and um, giving this climate action uh, a voice and some momentum. So thank you so much. So uh, my, my follow-up question was that um, I didn't notice, I guess this is for Kevin. I didn't notice that um, either ground source or air source heat pumps were mentioned. And I, I think for um, home heating, these are really essential because um, actually we, we are hoping that natural gas is actually referred to from now on as fracked gas um, moving forward. And what we're seeing in Massachusetts is that district geothermal is being <clears throat> put in in entire communities. And uh, this is something that, um, Sandy, I don't know if you remember, we came up to Albany and talked to you about this about five years ago. Um, we feel that that's a very strong candidate for reducing all of the um, carbon in, in New York State. And um, I'm hoping that that would be a bigger part of the pie um, in the next presentation, because I think it's really exciting. And geothermal, I think, has um, fantastic potential in New York State. Kevin? Yeah, thanks, Megan. And, and uh, you know, those, what you're referring to, uh, especially the, the um, heat source pumps, you know, that those are smaller scale technologies that, although um, we wouldn't likely count in the, um, you know, in, in terms of the base load generation mix, we are keeping our eye on. Um, and if we weren't before, then we definitely were with the presentation that was made uh, last week, the Climate Action Council. Connor mentioned the benefit cost analysis, which counts um, ground source heat pumps uh, considerably in the mix to get to, to the 2030 and 2040 goals, and then ultimately the decarbonization of the economy in the 2050 timeframe. Um, and that's going to factor uh, heavily the, the amount of penetration for that technology into um, into New York City and the uh, the goal and the challenge of electrifying um, New York City's uh, building and uh, housing stock. So uh, you're right to mention it. It's one of those uh, you know, relative nascent technologies that um, needs some uh, incentivization. Incentivization and uh, you know we're keeping our eye on it. Thanks, Kevin. Um, Andrew, next person. Next up, we have uh, Donna O'Malley. Um, Donna, if you want to unmute yourself. Hi. Um, I'm also uh, with Mothers Out Front um, in Westchester. And thank you all for taking your time to do this um, climate emergency uh, town hall. It's really informative, so thank you. And I guess I'm thinking my question might go to Assemblywoman Galef because it's, it concerns like a law. So I'm just wondering in order to meet the goals of the CLCPA, uh, Massachusetts and California have laws that govern new buildings and how they are fueled. Uh, I believe that they're only allowing them to have renewable sources. So I'm wondering if there is something that is being proposed or uh, something that is in place to kind of govern new construction and, and their energy source to be only renewables. 
Donna, I mean, we'll have to look into that. I don't know whether there are any bills on that topic. You know, it could be that Connor would know. But one of the things I found, because I had been, I've been getting emails from people about how do, why does the PSC allow more gas connections, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and speaking with the Public Service Commission, the, the difficulty they have, and I think somebody maybe mentioned it, it could be Kevin mentioned it, that um, our rules are, some of our laws are in place that don't allow them to say no to a, a, a company, a utility company coming through to do something. And there are also some regulations. So we have to change the laws for the public service commission, the utility laws. Uh, and I don't know whether, um, you know, there's been a whole effort to outline, it seems probably pretty complicated. Somebody's really gonna have to dig into those um, so that we can say no that, so if you're putting in a new building that you have to do such and such. Um, I mean, California may be very different in, in that format, um, but it may be that we have we have the ability to do it. I'm, I'm gonna have to research it. Does Connor know anything about that to help me out? Yeah, there is a piece of legislation that's been introduced by uh, Senator Kavanaugh. Um, and I have a number for you. Uh, Senate Bill 6843. Uh, and this one would deal with uh, all new construction, uh, uh, requiring all new construction to be all electric where, uh, where feasible. Uh, it, it allows for some very limited exemptions, uh, but in order to get that exemption, you also need to come up with a plan to uh, convert uh, when electrifying the building becomes uh, a viable option. Right. Well, we certainly need to do that with, I mean, new construction is the place to it's easier to start there with new construction versus, you know. Also in New York yeah, City Kevin? Council, there's also a New York City Council bill pending. Um, same, same idea that would uh, ban natural gas or uh, any fossil fuel for new construction in the city uh, and or any renovation of any building at that point and at the point of sale, then uh, they have to convert to renewable. Okay, so New York City, you said New York City has already done that? That, that bill is still pending. Um, you know, there's rumors that it may move before the end of the year, but uh, it's in the New York City Council. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Okay. Would you follow up with me too when you get more information, Donna, as you, you know, you're probably researching that through? I am. Yeah, okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, Andrew? Next up, we have uh, Judy. Um, Judy had a question um, about the Texas grid. I'm not sure if that question was answered or not. Judy, are you on? Yeah, it, it was. That was very interesting. I'm sort of familiar with ERCOT, the uh, Texas Envi Electrical uh, Reliability Council. Um, and I didn't realize that we had something parallel to it in New York State, and it was very interesting. And uh, gosh, that that was fabulous. Thank you. Great. And I, when we're all traveling more, uh, I really think you should get a tour up there. It, it, that huge control room, it is fantastic. I, I felt I was at NASA or someplace like that, or maybe the nuclear plants. But So if you don't mind, you know, because Texas um, did go through such a uh, a terrible time with reliability over, over, over the winter. I just, I wanna draw uh, some attention to major differences between their system and ours. Uh, first of all, the, the, uh, the Texas Reliability Council did not, um, did not mandate certain reliability standards that we require here in New York. And that led to uh, catastrophic outages. And, and then of course the humanitarian crisis in uh, not just in Texas, but through through parts of the Southeast. Um, and we also have uh, a pretty healthy, I mentioned this earlier, but a pretty healthy reserve margin here in New York. Uh, and in that process is, uh, is also, um, the, or that process, the Public Service Commission participates in that process. So um, the kind of reliability impacts that we saw with the Texas system um, 
I, would, I, I think it's fair to say are, are unlikely to happen here. So lest anybody thinks that there's uh, too many similarities between the way they run their system and the way that we run ours, it's almost night and day. Thank you. Andrew? Uh, next up, we have uh, Bob Schloss. Bob, if you want to unmute yourself. Hi, everybody. Um, I've heard this concept called a microgrid in which a kind of connected smaller zone um, sort of operates. It's sort of supposed to be good for resilience and efficiency. So I know that NYSERDA put up some money and funded some studies in many parts of the state, which then they picked from the evaluations. And I think they picked 10 projects that they're funding for really serious engineering design right now. And none of them are in Westchester. So my question is for Kevin, do you think there is advantages to us going up the learning curve on microgrids? And do you think there is something unique about the Westchester suburban thing where we could learn something and get benefits? Yeah, great question, Bob. I haven't thought about microgrids in a while, and you're smart to bring up that NYSERDA um, initiative. I, I'm, I have to say, I, I'm not current on that. And I thought that there was some funding for uh, a test case in Westchester, but uh, you might have better information on that than I do. I can tell you that uh, we were for a while paying attention to that. We're, and uh, very interested in, in microgrids setting up in various different parts of the state. I think Westchester County is probably a prime area for it uh, because there is high density population because um, you're prone, you've been prone to outages with the recent storms from Sandy on, on through to uh, the last winter. And uh, you know, we, from an engineering perspective and point of view, uh, would be interested in working with the localities as the as the microgrids are being set up. So I'm just going to say, Emily, uh, that about uh, seven miles south of here, there's a large campus that has part of Westchester Community College and maybe uh, three quarters of a mile away from that. There's a prison, a hospital, a dental school, a medical school, and some county facilities. It's like the place we take our recycling, among other things. And it just feels like either or both of them would be a great place to try this out. But again, I'm not an electrical engineer. Thanks for all the great info tonight. Yeah, no, you, you, you've got a pretty good idea of, of the, the basics in terms of setting up a microgrid. You need those kinds of facilities that you mentioned in order to install um, the, the different kinds of generation necessary to support a microgrid. Okay, we'll have to kind of look into that. Um, can you, Rob, can you, you know, give us as much information as you get as you go along? And yeah, I'm also already passing links to Andrew. And the thing that I want to do is just say, it's not just that it might be a good way to have energy reliability. If we involve our students, our high school students, right. our community college students, in other words, I want to address Eric's anxiety by saying, we're actually doing something. We're helping build it. We're helping measure it. And I think if we did that, we maybe also take some burden off the ISO and maybe we have less impact on some of the frontline communities in Westchester, which is what New York Renews and Eric, uh, and uh, sorry, Connor was talking about. So I, I'm not sure that microgrids is the best way to do something synergistic, but I'd love to see us do this. I'd like to see our district become famous for trying something new and bold. Right, so we'll look into the other 10 projects that NYSERDA has started, see where they are. Eric, you like that idea, right? I did, yeah. I, that I understood it, I wanna know more. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Andrew, next. Uh, next, we're going to go to Terry Cardos. Terry, if you want to unmute yourself. 
Yes, thank you. Um, this this uh, forum has been a great idea. Thank you. Um, I have two questions. My first one, I guess, is for Sandy Galef and Connor Bambrick and anyone else who has any expertise in, in this area. Um, I think uh, uh, Croton on Hudson has been sort of a leader in this area, um, putting solar panels on top of uh, parking lots and some commercial buildings. And I don't really know where the regulatory line is between jurisdictions, between state and municipalities. But I'm wondering if that is um, something that can be encouraged on a policy level, if not in regulations, at least on some sort of incentive um, level tax incentives or something else. It just seems like such a good idea for, for places uh, to put solar panels. Um, maybe I'll let Connor go first. I have a response to that. And Joel Gingold, I think, is on this. I don't know whether he's in the list to speak, but um, Croton is looking at a, a project uh, for solar over the parking lot at the um, MTA location, but also doing solar over um, along the riverfront um, where there is some, an asphalt parking uh, parking lot, but it's on um, environmental. It's it's it, it's been on land that um, is um, has has an environmental impact, and um, so in order to get that to be done, we have to pass legislation. Um, but there's a bottleneck. I don't know, Connor. Were you involved with? I, th I think you were. You're very supportive of the bill I had with Peter Harcum. I think. That would allow for um, uh, the air sort of above the, the these facilities to allow for right. install. Yeah, um, absolutely. It's definitely policies like those that need to go forward. Uh, you know, in a broader sense, um, you look at the climate law. Kevin sort of outlined all the various uh, mandates that we were putting on various technologies uh, in that climate law. I believe it was six thousand. Um, uh, megawatts worth of solar. Uh, the governor just last month uh, announced uh, increasing that target uh, to 10,000. Uh, so that's sort of the broader policy of you know, what would we call um, uh, distributed solar or behind the meter solar. Um, <clears throat> and then it's about making sure uh, that we're giving our municipalities the resources to lead. Um, they're the ones that are really going to have to be implementing this law. Uh, and, and taking on projects like that. So the state just needs to make sure that the, the resources are available for them to go forth and do that. Um, and then one final push here in terms of a legislative effort that could be made is uh, you know, making sure we're requiring new structures, new parking facilities to be you know, solar ready, to be electric vehicle infrastructure ready as well. That's another key component here that more municipalities can, can play a key role. Uh, Terry, just a comment too. Mary Knoll, um, which is in Austin, has just done a whole solar panel. I, I think that was in my newsletter if, if you got it. And so impressive as, you know, a, a private, well, it's a religious community, but deciding to go forward um, to do that. Do we, can, is Joel going to, Andrew, is he, oh, I see him. Did he want to speak on this issue? Yes, Joel is on our list. We can, of course, Add Joel Can we now. jump in just because we're talking about this issue right now? <laughs> okay, thanks, Sandy. <laughs> uh, number one, thanks to you and to all the panelists for doing this. You always seem to pick the really important issues to do these forums on. <clears throat> but I think Terry uh, pretty well laid out some of the things I wanted to talk about. Uh, the CLCPA is great. Uh, has policy, but we're not implementing it. Uh, I believe the CAC is about a year behind in getting their policy out. Um, it assumes we're gonna have 6,000 or maybe 10,000 megawatts of solar, but look what's happening. Uh, Sandy and Connor referred to this. There is one man, Stephen Engelbright, who is the chair of the Environmental Conservation Committee in the assembly, 
who is personally holding up a bill which would allow us all to put solar panels in the parking lots of Parkland. And we have a project in Croton, which would have been finished by now if that bill had been passed. Uh, and there are over a thousand parking Parkland parking lots in the state, which could add incredible amounts of solar if this one man would allow this bill to come up before his committee and-, and Right, so let me with, just- let me just say that Steve Engelbright, a assemblyman from Long Island, is, is a very good environmentalist, but um, he has an issue with um, dedicated uh, parkland. And we do dedicate parkland in lots of different communities. And, and um, just to, um, you know the issue, uh, he just has a problem. He wants to do it one by one instead of as a, as a general philosophy. So, you know, hopefully we'll be able to do it. But, but I think it represents, it, it represents the change we have to go through, you know, with, with elected officials and how we look at these projects if we really wanna move forward uh, with, with uh, good climate reform issues. Uh, but he, you know, so don't, he's a really good environmental person. Okay, continue. Oh, okay, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to embarrass anybody, but <laughs> as Sandy well knows, this is one of my things. And we've been working with Sandy on trying to get this done somehow. But the other thing I'd like to point out is that all of these things seem like they'd be slam dunks, but you just look what's happened locally. Town of Cortland wants to put a moratorium on, on solar projects, because they have a big NIMSI, NIMBY contingent uh, who's opposing one of the projects as proposed there. Uh, there's a project proposed in Croton uh, and the golf course, which has come up before the village board. Again, you would think it would be a slam dunk, but they are walking very slowly. So we have a NIMBY problem all over the state, in fact, all over the country with a lot of these projects. And I don't know if anybody would like to comment on, on how to overcome it. If you look at what's going on in Washington, uh, they have not been able to come together on, on the bill that President Biden proposed, which had a lot of environmental aspect, climate aspects to it. Um, well, I think, okay, let's, let's stop there with Joe because Let's go to the solar farms. What's happening in our area, which Eric lives in our area, but but Connor and, and Kevin don't, um, you know, these proposed solar farms, but cutting the issue is cutting down the trees. trees so yeah. so what's the where where do we go with the trees and the solar? Is that an issue around our state? Um, well, know, that's, we, that's one reason why I brought this thing up about commercial buildings and parking lots, because it avoids the, 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 the thorny issue of cutting down trees, because you don't have to do that. I mean, I, you know, I do that, have that problem of cutting down trees to put up solar panels, too. I mean, this, this avoids it. it. It does seem like a no-brainer. Okay, let's see. Connor, has that come up as an issue legislatively? Um, well, I guess I'll say two things. I mean, yes, it, it is a concern. You need to strike the proper balance. Uh, it's not just about trees. It's also uh, the use of uh, agricultural land is really big now as well. Oh, right. Um, yeah. So legislatively, um, last year, uh, the legislature uh, passed legislation creating the, the Office of Renewable Energy Siting. And uh, a piece, and, then, and that was specifically to streamline larger scale uh, projects of solar and wind, uh, but with very specific provisions in there that allows for, uh, that makes sure that, that, that these types of impacts are, are mitigated in one way or another before a project is allowed to go forward. Um, so you got to strike the right balance. The second thing I'll note is um, uh, the Nature Conservancy uh, has been working hard to come up with a map all across New York State of the ideal areas uh, for siting of, of renewables in order to strike that balance and make sure uh, the lands that need to be protected are, are continuing to be protect protected. So is someplace like Croton, Eric, going to be excited when somebody from the Nature Conservancy comes in and said, this is a good place? I mean, are we going to have those kind of problems, um, you know, if they do and they don't in a community? 
you're asking me about about the impl the implications for for yeah. what would happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What what does an organization like Croton 100 do? Are they supportive of almost everything? My goodness. Well, I, you know, I, I um, it's a tough one for for me to answer. Uh, it's not really my focus within Croton 100, but I'll say that I. I think that they would appreciate the complexity of that question, and there would be a lot of thought. Uh, really, as there, as you all are weighing the pros and cons, it, it does strike me as a sticky question. Um, I'm afraid that's a, I'm punting there. I'm afraid. Right now, that's okay. I, but I'm I, sorry, I certainly I, I no no no. But I certainly uh, I certainly understand the conundrum, and I, I, I had the very same question myself. So right. Okay, Andrew. Uh, next up, we have Richard of Richard's iPhone. Richard, if you want to unmute yourself. Hi, Richard of Richard's iPhone. <laughs> Richard, you're muted. Uh, Richard, we can't hear yes. you. Okay, good. Ah, there we go. <laughs> uh, we focus on energy efficiency in the cooling sector. Commercial refrigeration, air conditioning in all sectors, and even residential refrigeration is in horrible shape. The design of these units have a condenser coil area that's supposed to throw off the heat. And the design is usually airflow in with all the dust and debris that comes in. Your home refrigeration unit gets clogged, the condenser coils. That's a waste of maybe 280 kilowatt hours a year for your home unit. A commercial unit is 1260 kilowatt hours per unit per year. And food service has maybe five to 15 units running. So what we're trying to get everybody to, to uh, pay attention to is the need for preventative maintenance on cooling equipment. You got to clean the heat transfer coils. You got to change the filters out when they're supposed to be changed. And you might say, well, what does that do? We calculated that 25% of the stationary energy emissions for New York City is due to dirty AC, dirty refrigeration. And you might, you might want to say, well, how did we get that number? We got it from a global study by the Carbon Trust, ASHRAE UK, and the International Refrigeration Institute. And what I'm gonna do is send all of you presenters our information, because this is something, you know, energy efficiency is bandied about. Everybody says energy efficiency, and they never define what they mean by that. This is something that uh, it's basically an energy, uh, a metastatic energy cancer on the Con Ed grid. Um, we've tried to convince them of mm -hmm. this, and they don't care, quite frankly. Richard, are you with an organization that you're trying to convince? I mean, you have a group of people. We're a startup. And You're we startup. developed a patented coil cleaning technology that uses no toxic coil cleaners only to discover we didn't have a market for it because food service and healthcare do not do refrigeration coil cleaning at all. They let the units run dirty. And then we, uh, we expanded out to considering air conditioning, which is not our focus area. Um, th this carbon trust study basically concludes that all global cooling equipment across the board is consuming 25% more electric than it should because of lack of maintenance. Uh, the global uh, power plant emissions are 2.6 billion metric tons of CO2. And they said it could be dropped to 2.1 billion with better cleaning and servicing. But quite frankly, um, it's a psychological problem because owners don't want, nobody wants to be told they have to do work. 
They want automatic solutions. And that's the big barrier for right. us. I would think of a place for that information to is to get it to maybe the Energy Committee in the New York State Assembly or Senate, maybe the Climate Action Council. Once oh, I'm working on that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Fine. Does anybody because know uh, Dennis Elsenbeck? Connor, you I know talk Dennis? To him. Yeah, I talked to him. He's on the CAC. Uh, Bob Howarth is on the CAC. And both of them said, of course, that makes so much sense. So we at least have two people on the CAC okay. that said, gee, this is something maybe we should just put down as a strategy, you know, maintenance. Okay. That's great. Thank I just you. got a new refrigerator. You're making me feel guilty. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> My old not, one wasn't working. <laughs> here's a tip. If you have a, res, a residential refrigerator, do not pull it off the wall and use brushes and vacuums. Take a hairdryer for the, from the front. Right. Quick bursts from the front and you'll solve the problem. I had a refrigerator that, the, that wasn't working well, the freezer wasn't working, and instead of defrosting itself, it froze up. Yep. So I was with a hairdryer on the floor, uh, defrosting that for probably two years, and then I finally decided, I guess I need a new refrigerator. So uh, I got okay. one, and they weren't many available uh, because of the cycle of getting anything. So gotcha. anyway, thank you, Richard, very thank much. You. Uh, thank you. Andrew, next. Sorry about that. I realized I was muted. Um, so there was a question that somebody who he had to um, hop off, um, but it's a question uh, if the panel could comment on the New York Builds Public Renewables Act and the New York Utility Democracy Act, um, which would help initiate the transition outlined under the CLCPA. Um, and this kind of ties into a question that I know Emily was uh, planning on asking. Um, so Emily, if you want to ask your question and then we'll kind of tie it all together under the umbrella of advocacy. Sure, thank you, Andrew. And thank you to everyone for the really informative session tonight. I really learned a lot. Um, my name is Emily Timmel. I'm from um, Croton on Hudson. I'm a member of Mothers Out Front. And I wanted to first thank you, Assembly Rungala, for supporting the CCIA. Um, and my question is really feeling the anxiety that Eric is talking about and wanting to see this bill get passed. What can we do to support you in finding more sponsors? And, um, you know, who should we target to get this bill passed? Now, are you, are you talking about the bill that I had introduced or it's somebody else's bill you're talking about, right? Yes, but you were yes. you put the name on as supporting and sponsoring it, right? Right. Yeah. I, you know, I think it's just, um, you know, reaching out to, uh, you know, people that you, you you think should be on an environmental bill. Uh, they may be on the environmental committee. I know that uh, Joel Ginkle didn't they reach? I think you reached out to a lot of the people on the environmental committee and the assembly and also the Senate because that's a good place to start on environmental issues. Uh, sometimes it's it's finding people on the energy commission committees because most of those bills you have to look at which bills go to which committees and you first want to be sure that you've got enough votes on the committee to get a bill out, uh, which is important. And, you know, I think um, it's not just getting sponsors, it's getting people in legislative districts to call their legislators. I mean, I have to tell you, Croton and my communities call me all the time. Lots, I'm on lots of Zooms on climate issues because people really care about it. And so, um, you know, that's important to energize the public. And letters to the editor are really important. Just talk about the bills so that you get other people that don't know about it to email us. And we get emails all the time, hundreds of emails a day. Um, so I don't know whether that's helpful. Connor, you're up in Albany and, you know, are there, do you find certain methods? If you get the environmental advocates to support a bill, they put together, um, you know, like a, what do you call it, Connor? Legislator package that you wanna get, you wanna get done and we look at that very seriously. 
Yeah, we typically, uh, each year, we'll put out our own action agenda that lays out our priority legislation, lays out our budget priorities. And then we have a, a, a system, MOs, uh, that we put out on legislation uh, where we rate, uh, uh, you know, just how environmentally beneficial a piece of legislation is, or on the flip side, uh, how a particular piece of legislation could be harmful to the environment. Uh, and when uh, I... When I see a bill on on that, I know I have to really look at that bill uh, to see whether, you know, because I, I admire environmental advocates a lot as a group. So I, I look to them for very good advice. Um, but I noticed that my bills, you had my solar bill for homeowners on your list. And all of a sudden we got a number of people on the bill just because it was on their list. <laughs> So, um, you know, it's kind of like magic to be on the environmental advocates list for the people that care about the environment. It's it's a magic list to get on. So, um, you know, I don't I don't know whether Kevin, you don't do any of this this kind of uh, lobbying advocacy. No, we do not. We we do watch the bills very carefully, but we do not weigh into uh, an advocacy position for or against legislation. That's something that uh, that we feel comfortable with, considering that we need to remain as impartial for a uh, number of different reasons as possible. So, but we, you know, Connor and I, for instance, are uh, we talk uh, probably more frequently coming up here we just, of the uh, the work that the, we end up doing together via the uh, CLCTA and the climate action Council. So we do we do keep uh, in close contact with the advocacy organizations. Okay, um, Andrew, I don't. We're getting close to a bewitching hour of nine o'clock. Not that we were bewitched, but um, how many more people do we have with questions? So everyone who had one question already asked their question. Um, I don't know if you want to take a moment for final thoughts and wrapping up, or if you want to try to squeeze in a couple more questions. Um, you know, maybe we'll maybe we'll do that. Um, maybe starting with Eric. Um, I mean, what should we do? How do we do? I thought your presentation was so interesting. It, it's such a different perspective on everything. Yeah. And I'm a grandparent. So I think I better start talking to my grandchildren a lot about this and find out what their their thoughts are. Yeah, it's an interesting idea. And there's a, there's a, there's a challenging question in there as well. I don't know how old your grandchildren are. But the way um, in which two we... Two in college and one a junior in high school. Okay, so so... Um, old enough to know to know what's going on. Um, I think that would be a, a fascinating thing for you to do, of course. Um, I think that it's something that, you know, I, I, I have a, in my experience clinically, actually, I, I've found that young people seem not to come into my office talking about it, but when asked, or when you encounter it, there's lots to say, and there's, a, and that opens up a lot of things. So, you know, uh, I think it's a fair thing to to wonder uh, about your children or grandchildren, and, and to even introduce the topic in, in reference to recent headlines, perhaps as a as a point of entry. Right. So it doesn't feel like you're just sort of you know having a talk like a you know the climate talk if you want to think of it that way. There's it's all it's all around us now. Um, I just had one other reflection, if it's okay, is that I've been listening with 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 really uh, with a lot of interest to all the practical the, the real sort of nuts and bolts issues. And uh, I'm, I'm really interested in further dialogue and outreach with all the people who have spoken and who have commented in trying to, in fact, do this very thing that I was talking about is to bridge, bridge, bridge across the generations and, and to try to have young people understand the workings of, of how this is all meant to unfold and, and then exactly where they can put their weight. Um, my experience is, is that, that they're not entirely clear I know it's a huge generalization to talk like that, but but it's a point of confusion for many people, not just young people. Um, and and so I'm I'm very looking forward to a lot more dialogue with with all the parties present today. Right, terrific. Um, I think that's one of my Thanksgiving topics. We always we always have very interesting topics at thanks at the Thanksgiving Day table, not necessarily related to the turkey. <laughs> but <laughs> I guess it could be related to the turkey. Mm -hmm. uh, any any closing thoughts, Kevin, and then Connor. Uh, I just, uh, first of all, I want to I thank Eric for his work. My wife is, uh, is a therapist as well. 
it's working primarily with children, so I can relate to a lot of um, a, a lot of the, the, the work that he's doing and it's important work. I also want to thank him for um, uh, focusing on these issues because you know, uh, with two children of my own um, and my oldest daughter in uh, sophomore year in college, these these children have been through an enormous amount, right? With the pandemic, um, a lot of loss that they've encountered. And uh, I, I, I know that in the background, in, in addition to dealing um, a lot of the stress and strain the last couple of years, they're acutely aware of what's happening in the environment. And it compounds um, the, the other challenges that they're facing. So she is, uh, I'm happy and proud to say, uh, part of the Goodwin Mearing Program at Connecticut College studying environmental science. So she has her passion, she has her goals. Um, so Thank you, Eric, for your work. I thank Connor for um, his work as well. And I look forward to working with him uh, closer. We spoke, I think it was last week, Connor. And, um, you know, we've got uh, something that we can collaborate on. And, uh, and some of them, thank you for your many years of service over the years and, uh, and for inviting me to this forum today. And, and lastly, thank you to your constituents for being active and involved and, and interested in engaging on your own. Yes, they certainly are. Thanks, Kevin. Connor? Yeah, and you know, right back at you, Kevin. I, I really appreciate uh, you know, the direction that the NISO is going in these days. And uh, this, uh, you know, excited about this, this upcoming change to the mission. Um, I, I, it's, you know, definitely much needed, but uh, I think it'll do go a long way towards helping uh, you know, uh, policy, you know, go further down the road. Uh, knowing that, that the NISO is working there to make sure that, that reliability is still going to be in place and while we're implementing this. And, and Eric, your presentation was, was just unbelievable. I just, you know, constantly think of my two children going through this and, um, you know, they have, well, they have to live with me, so they hear about it all the time. Um, my my five-year-old actually actively lobbied uh, to get the climate law passed. Well, he was five. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but really, it is, it is about the youth. Um, they're really driving this movement. Uh, I have the pleasure of working with so many young people in the Renews Coalition on a day in, day out basis. And, and they're inspiring. Their energy that they're bringing to this um, is, is really is really pushing this uh, issue to the forefront. Um, and then finally, I'll just focus in on, you know, as we're going forward, we're talking about, uh, as you mentioned, these solutions. But it's really important to make sure uh, we're talking to the communities on the front line. We're talking to those communities that have been harmed uh, from environmental injustice and not coming to them with our pre thought out solutions about what we think are good for their communities, but actually going there, listening to what's going on in their communities and helping to lift up the solutions that they're developing locally. Ideas out there. We just got to make sure that we're actively uh, listening here. Uh, and then finally, uh, assembly member, thank you so much for again. I was, uh, I, I was I had the pleasure of presenting at your your last environmental forum two years ago uh, that you mentioned up at the beginning. Uh, so it's nice to be. Right. So all great. I think it's a continuing story because we're not going to have the solutions overnight. But um, thank you all so much for being here. And if if um, I, I'd love to see if. If you have the ability to send us your slides, if that works, so that we can actually send it out, because people may want to use some of the information that they have with their organizations. So, um, you know, I hope that this is just, you know, a, one focal point, but that we can spread it out more. So, you know, give that consideration if you would, as as wonderful speakers tonight. And I want to thank the audience for being here. And if you have, I think Andrew put in the chat, if you have. Um, any questions, thoughts, or whatever, you know, email us. And if you want to get to um, our panelists, uh, we will send that off to the panelists too. So thank you so much. Have we covered everything? We had a good night. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, participants. And have a good evening and have no more rain right away. Bye. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> so much, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Thank you to our guests. Thank you. Bye-bye. Audience. Thank you for your Bye. Great